Come on, Five Point. Yes, sir. How many of you took part in Reach Week or some of the disaster relief stuff that we've done to try to help our city and our community? Good job, good job, good job. Thank you so much. It is so cool to see the big C come together to help the community, the little C also. We kind of learned that next year, instead of doing Reach Week, I think we're going to do Reach Month. That way it gives people more time to get involved and just continue to love our city in the way that we can. Well, I've been up since 4 a.m. with a knot in my stomach, preparing, reading, praying, thinking, studying how to deliver this message. Probably the toughest I've had to do in 20 years as a pastor of this church. I'll be glad when today is over and we can move on. We're in a series called Asking for a Friend. You know, it's questions that, you know, you would never want to ask me, but, you know, you'd be asking for a friend, and, and we're talking about some tough, tough questions. So today, we're going to be looking at, can I be a Christian and be a transgender, homosexual, a lesbian, sexually moral? And we're going to look at it from the world's view and the word's view. So, you ready for a word? I will start all over again. So, are you ready for a word? Repeat after me, please. Holy Spirit, I'm going to hear this word so I can receive this word so I can live this word. And everybody said? Amen, amen. Let me see him. I got my Bible, Pastor. Got my Bible, got my Bible. Good job, good job. You're a first-time guest. We are so honored you're here. You picked a doozy to come on the first one. But if you don't have a Bible, I mean, you're like, well, a lot of churches don't take Bibles to church. It's okay. It's not that it's the way we are here. It's our vision. I want to see the people of God in the house of God with the word of God. Just read with us on the big screen, but if you need one after the service, go to Connections and we'll give you one free because we know what this thing will do. But most of the time, it's not that we don't have them, so we don't what? We don't read them. So how many of you since last Sunday have read your Bible every day? Every day. Good job. Good job. For those who haven't, come on. Get back. Get back into the Word. Take your Bibles. Turn to Genesis 1. Turn to Genesis 1. Turn to Matthew 19. And turn to 1 Corinthians 2. And we will be kind of making our way through all three of those places. Genesis 1, Matthew 19, 1 Corinthians 2. Several weeks ago, I started this series by laying the foundation. And then this message was supposed to be the next week, but of course we had the hurricane. And then last week, I was at Green Sea teaching where I gave my life to Christ 37 years ago. So good to see old friends and people who played a part in me come to know Christ. Then I listened to Pastor Mark on the way home. And I'd asked him on Tuesday, Pastor Mark, would you, would you change the topic to why do bad things happen to good people? How many of you enjoyed what Pastor Mark had to say? Man, he did a good job. Thank you, Pastor Mark. So good. And our, our students get to hear that kind of teaching every week. I'm so proud of him and what's happening with Five Point Youth. But the very first week was I, I, tried, I tried to lay the foundation. And we did this by walking into the city of Corinth with the Apostle Paul. And he sees all these pagan temples and these pagan gods and, 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 and all the sexual morality that's going on. And, and, and he saw the Roman theater. And we looked at the Roman theater because it had a very unique way of teaching. They wanted to teach you through entertainment. And what we saw, number one, was that the absurd had become the norm. You go into the theater and the theater would do something shocking. You go, oh! But then the next week, it would seem a whole lot more normal to you. Well, they're doing the same thing today. The things that we used to see, we go, oh my goodness, have just become the norm. But also that week, I, I tried to explain to you that, number two, we're all sinners. We're all sinners. And I want you to look at this sin meter that you kind of made up. And, and, and let me ask you a question. How many of you, and don't be Mr. or Ms. Spiritual, how many of you would agree you struggle with one or two of these sins on the sin meter? Raise your hand real quick. There we go. But isn't it amazing how we'll look at certain sins as Christians and go, okay, I struggle with this, but if someone struggles with a sin that we don't struggle with, they're wrong. So we know that we all sin. The Bible says it, Romans 3.23 says this, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace. I've taught you this before. What does the word justified mean? It's just as if I'd never sinned. Say it with me. It's just as if I'd never sinned. Well, what justifies us? By his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Think of it saying this, not changing the words of the Bible, just kind of changing the way that we would say it. I know that I'm a sinner, and I know I fall short of the glory of God, but I've been justified, just as if I've never sinned, by the blood of the Christ. 
of the blood of the cross of Christ, which gives me grace. Thank you, Jesus, for who you are and what you are and what you did. So as we dive into a tough topic, remember, you struggle with sin also. So we're going to ask the question today, can I be a Christian while living as a transgender, as a homosexual, as a lesbian, sexually immoral? And some people are going to say, you you got no business talking about this in the church. If we don't talk about it in the church, where are we going to hear the truth? The world is not going to teach what the Word of God says. The world is going to teach their desire and their vision only. Now our children are being taught that without knowing the world, what the Word has to say. So we're going to answer that question twofold today. Can I be a Christian while living as? And we're going to look at it through the world's opinion, but also the Word's opinion. Now I want you to think with me. We have more opinions today than we ever have. Man, we've got personal opinions, we've got family opinions, we've got political opinions, we got, we've got uh, think of something opinions. And the platform to put our opinions out there have gotten bigger and bigger, and now we can put our opinion out for the world to see and hide. But somewhere along the line, we have forgotten to ask God what his opinion is. So we're gonna look at the world's opinion on that question, can I be a Christian and live this lifestyle? Versus what the Word of God says. I can remember 44 years ago, Deb and I had Michelle. Well, Deb had Michelle, and, and I stood there for moral support. But, but after we had Michelle, I gave out pink cigars. And we took Michelle home in a pink blanket. And then, and then 10 years later, when we had Andrew, I handed out blue cigars. And we took Andrew home in a blue blanket. And that was just the norm then. But but that's not the norm anymore. Did you realize that there are two, 72 recognized genders now? I started to put them all up on the board, but I can't pronounce a lot of them, much less try to read all of them. But but, but now we have what's called the LGBTQ+. The plus is, you know, we've got so many now, we can't put them all up there. But I want to make sure you understand what this means. It means lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, plus all the others. And they're saying that we should accept all 72 of these genders. And we may think that's absurd, but it's now becoming, say it with me, it's now becoming the, the norm. And, and I can remember growing up that, you know, Deb and I, we didn't talk about transgenders. We didn't really have any. We didn't talk about homosexual a lot. We didn't talk about lesbian. I mean, it just, it wasn't real prevalent. But the older we got, the more that we've seen, this is the world that we live in. And so I want you to kind of take a time back in history with me. Remember back in 2008, I remember ISIS King was the first transgender person to compete on America's Next Top Model. And everybody's like, oh my goodness. And then we saw in 2014 on the cover of Time Magazine, and this kind of became the transgender tipping point. And then that year also we saw Laverne Cox was the first trans to receive an Emmy acting nomination for Orange is the New Black. But then in 2015, this is where it really began to be the norm. How many of you remember Caitlyn Jenner? I mean, it's like it was shocking. I can't believe this is going on. And, and transgender became a common expression in our homes at that time. 2016, it was announced that no longer could a transgender not be a part of the military. 2020, Elliot Page publicly comes out as a transgender on Netflix's Umbrella Academy. And because this person had, now they had the character become also. May of 2022, Disney, employees no longer allowed to say him or her. They had to say to dreamers of all ages. In 2022, also in the state of Connecticut, Schools, by law, had to provide tampon dispensers in ladies and neutral genders and at least one male bathroom. In 2022, we saw Leah Thomas become the first transgender to win an NCAA swimming championship. And next year, 2025, on February 8th, the Boy Scouts will no longer be called Boy Scouts, but Scouting gender neutral. This may seem absurd to us, but it's becoming the norm. 
This isn't hearsay. This is coming straight from one of my best pastor friends. A lot of you probably remember Jeff Moody, the little shorter pastor. And, and he comes and speaks you know, just about every year for us. He lives in Durham, North Carolina. He's pastor of Evolve Church. His son, just a few months ago, got in trouble at school. He's in middle school. And a girl was wearing cat ears, whiskers, and a tail. And her parents had demanded that the school put a litter box in the bathroom. And they did. If you're a middle school kid and a girl walks by you with ears, cat ears, whiskers, a cat tail, and wants to go to the bathroom in the litter box. So he walked, him and some other friends walked by and went, <sighs> they hissed. I'm not going to tell you what I probably would have done. <sighs> the next day, they were taken into the principal's office and reprimanded because the parents had come in and said, that's aggressive behavior towards our daughter. Jeff told me, he said, I'm taking my dog and telling them they have to teach this dog because my dog identifies as a student. The media, the entertainment industry, industry would lead us to believe that a large portion of our community, our population, are transgenders. Not true. It's only 0.6% in our country even claim to be a transgender. Gallup finds that 7.6% of U.S. adults identify as lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, or something other than straight or heterosexual. And that's doubled since 2012. In other words, maybe 8% of our country would identify with what we're talking about this morning. But it has, the absurd has become the norm. So back to our original question. Can I be a Christian while living as a transgender, a homosexual, a lesbian, or someone who has a sexually immoral lifestyle? Can I just be really honest and blunt with you? It's hard for me to get upset with someone who lives outside the walls of the church to answer anything but yes to that question. Well, sure I can. Why would you say that, Pastor? Because the church has done such a pitiful job to make them think otherwise. Think with me. There's a church on every corner in most cities. And if you don't like the theology of one church, you just go across the street and get the theology of another one. The Methodist church now will marry two men. You no longer can say partner or wife. You just say this is, I mean, husband or wife, you say partner. If you're living in that homosexual, lesbian lifestyle, why wouldn't you think you can go to heaven when you can go to a church? Why wouldn't you say that you're a Christian when you can go to a church? And that's exactly what they're going to say. And it's even come to the point now that if you don't like the version of the Bible, the Word of God, that you can now find another version. So I bought one. I bought the Queen James Bible. I thought, Nah. So I, I ordered one on Amazon and opened it up. Guys, this is on the first page. You can't choose your sexuality. In other words, you know, God made you a male to be a female. You can't choose that. But you can choose Jesus, and now you can choose the Bible too. And what they've done is I, I went and looked. They've taken the eight verses and they've changed the eight verses that deal with these topics, and they've changed them to fit their theology. Well, it's kind of hard to be upset with a lost and dying world when this is what they see happening in the church. Come on, are you getting this, guys? So let's look at a different sin meter. Let's look at this sin meter. You know, the majority of you in this room and the people in the church are going to say, yeah, get those gay and lesbians, pastor. Yeah, get those transgenders and, and map. You know, they're not called pedophiles anymore. They're called minor attracted persons. In other words, God made me attracted to have sex with a five-year-old. It's not my fault. That's the absurd now, but buckle up. It's going to become the norm. And so we'll say that those sins are wrong. 
But isn't it amazing how if you've been married for 10, 15 years, you get divorced that you just continue having sex with who you want? And that's okay. Or, or you know, you're going to look at porn and you know, take care of pleasure yourself. I mean, that's perfectly fine. Or, or I'm just a teenager. I'm just exploring, you know, my, my boyfriend, my girlfriend's body. Then that's okay. God doesn't care. Or, or you're just having sex, but you're not going all the way. Or, or you're going to get married in a year, and so we're going to have sex. You know, those sins aren't that big a deal because, you know, those are my sins. And that is exactly what the church thinks because so many people in the church live that way. So the world is screaming, this is my body, and I will do with it what I want. This is my body. It's not God's body. This is my body. So if I want to change from one sex to another, if I want to use it to have sex, the world is screaming, it is perfectly fine, and you can be a Christian during all of this. And the church isn't doing a whole lot to make them think otherwise. That's the world's opinion. So can I be a transgender? Can I? Yeah, sure. And be a Christian. But I don't want to look at just the world's opinion. I want to look at the word's opinion. I want to see what the Bible has to say about these things. So you don't have to turn there, but I want to read from John 1. John 1. And it says, in the beginning, we're going to go to the beginning in a moment. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. In other words, from the very beginning, when God created, he knew what this was going to say. History hadn't even happened, but he knew what the word of God was going to say. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. God knew the word. And the way that you draw closer to God is through the word of God. Take your Bibles. Turn to Genesis 1. Turn to Genesis 1. Verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and earth. Who created the heavens and earth? God did. Well, I can't think of a better way to figure out the purpose of something created than to look at who created it. So if God created us, why don't we look at what God has to say of how he created us? Skip down to verse 26. Then God said, who said? Let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heaven and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image in the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. So three things I want to point out about this portion of scripture that's very important for us to understand. First of all, who said it? God said. God said this. Not some man, not, this is God the Father himself said this. Secondly, he said very clearly that we are created in the image and the likeness of, of God. It says it. Let us make man in our image. In his own image, in the image of God, he created them. God was not a homosexual. God was not a lesbian. God was not a transgender. God was God, and he made us in his image. So here's the question that I want to ask a lost and dying world. If the God that you believe in made a mistake when he created you, why do you want to worship him? That makes no sense. So why do you want to say that you can be a Christian when you are admitting that he made a mistake with you? God does not make mistakes. Third thing, we see that God commanded to reproduce. How do you reproduce if you ain't got one woman and one man? It's the only way possible. They have, still haven't figured out that one yet. And I've heard people say, well, this is just, you know, a, a 21st century problem. They didn't really have these problems back then. Really? You don't have to turn there, but I'm going to read from the book of Leviticus. Now, if you remember, God's people have made their way out of Egypt, made their way towards uh, 
the promised land, and it's 1446 B.C. Exodus 20, you get the Ten Commandments. The following chapters, you get the instructions for the tabernacle. The last chapter of Exodus, you will see the glory of God come down. But then you get the book of Leviticus. And Leviticus is just a continuation of this is how I want my people to live. And it says very clearly, this is back in 1446 B.C., 3,000 years ago, Leviticus 18. And you shall not lie sexually with your neighbor's wife, and so make yourself unclean with her. You shall not give any of your children to offer them to Moloch, and so profane the name of your God. I am the Lord. You shall not lie with a male as with a woman. It is an abomination. You shall not lie with any animal, and so make yourself unclean with it. Neither shall any woman give herself to an animal to lie with it. It is perversion. No, God's people are surrounded by people who are living this way. So it's not like this is the first time we've ever heard of this. Deuteronomy, 1406, 1446 B.C. to 1406 B.C. are the 40 years in the wilderness. About 1407, Moses begins to prepare the next generation. That other generation has died off. And he says in Deuteronomy 22, a woman shall not wear a man's garment, nor shall a man put on a woman's cloak, for whoever does these things is an abomination to the Lord your God. Don't act like this is a new problem because it's not. As long as there has been men, there has been sin. But I've heard people also say that Jesus didn't address this, okay? Were there transgenders in that day? I don't know, but I disagree. I think Jesus did address this. Go to Matthew 19. Go to Matthew 19. Matthew 16, he's in Caesarea Philippi, and he's taken his disciples to the most pagan place on the planet and said, we win. The church prevails. Matthew 17, he goes to the Mount of Transfiguration, shows his glory, to, his glory to Peter, James, and John. Matthew 18, he makes his way back to Capernaum, where he stayed for three years. In Matthew 19, he's making his way toward the city of Jerusalem to be crucified. Chapter 19, verse 1. Now, when Jesus had finished saying these sayings, all right, that takes us back to Matthew 18. He talked about the parable of the lost sheep, and then that's where Peter said, hey, how many times should I forgive my brother? When he'd finished saying these things, He went away from Galilee and entered the region of Judea beyond the Jordan. You can see, this is the wilderness. This is back towards the city of Jerusalem in that area where Jesus had been baptized and where he spent 40 years in the wilderness. And large crowds followed him, and he healed them there. And the Pharisees came up to him and tested him by asking, is it lawful to divorce one's wife for any cause? And he answered, have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female? We just read that from Genesis 2. And said, therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to this wife, and the two shall become one flesh. How do the two become one flesh? That's the sexual intercourse. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. And they said to him, why then did Moses command one to give a certificate? He goes on to explain. So I believe he very clearly addresses that a man and a woman are the way that his design, his purpose for marriage should be. So here's my question. Here's my question. It doesn't seem that difficult to me to understand God's design. So why is the world looking at it so differently? What a great question. I'm so glad you asked. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Remember, Paul has walked into the city. And he sees all of these pagan gods, these temples. Man, there's, there's temple prostitutes. There's so much sin. And we have a problem. There's people there who've said, you know what? I'm a Christian, but I'm going to live as I desire. And Paul addresses this and says, mm, no, no, that's not the case. 1 Corinthians 2, verse 6. Please listen to this. Please, if you hadn't heard anything else because you're like, this guy's a moron. Just please catch this, okay? Yet among the mature, those being spiritually mature, we do impart wisdom. Okay, for those who have the Holy Spirit, you receive wisdom. Although it is not a wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age who are doomed to pass away. In other words, they will die and go to hell. But we impart impart a secret and hidden wisdom of God. That's the Holy Spirit which God decreed before all the ages of our glory. When he said, 
Let there be light. This wisdom, the Holy Spirit was right there when he created the heavens and the earth. Now, of the rulers of this age, none of the rulers of this age understand this. For if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. This is the Messiah, the Son of God, and they crucified him because they don't have the wisdom. They don't have the Holy Spirit. But as it's written, but no eye has seen nor ear heard nor heart of man imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. If you've ever fallen radically in love with Jesus and the Holy Spirit is a part of you, you understand this ain't home. And what he has before us is absolutely incredible. Keep going. These things, the things that he has prepared for us, God has revealed to us, listen, listen, through the Spirit. So without the Spirit, how can you know the things that God has revealed to you? Can't. Keep going. God has revealed to us through the Spirit, for the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. In other words, the Holy Spirit knows your thoughts, he knows your actions, he knows your heart, because he searches everything. The Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God, for who knows a person's thoughts except the Spirit of that person? Nobody, except the Holy Spirit himself, which is him, which is in him. So also, listen, listen, no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. You cannot understand the Word of God, the Spirit of God, without the Holy Spirit. Keep going. Now, we have received not the spirit of the world. Did you catch that? We're not supposed to think like the world. But the spirit who is from God, the Holy Spirit, that we might understand the things freely given us by God. Do you understand why the world doesn't understand and think the way we do about male, female, marriage between a man and a woman? Because they can't. They don't have the Holy Spirit. It's impossible for them to think the way we do. Keep going. And we impart this in words, not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Spirit. Interpreting spiritual truths of those who are spiritual. So when I open the Word of God and I read this, it's very easy for me to understand because I have the Holy Spirit. But lost people don't. Verse 14. The natural person, the person who doesn't have Christ doesn't know Christ, doesn't have the Holy Spirit, does not accept the things of the Spirit of God for their folly to him. And he's not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. If you don't know God, you have no desire to live by the Word of God because the Holy Spirit doesn't dwell inside of you. And if the Holy Spirit doesn't dwell inside of you, why would you want to live by the Word of God? But if the Holy Spirit does dwell inside of you, then why aren't you living for God? We have a major problem. You see, the church is confusing the world. Because we'll say, oh, you can't change the word of God. They can't do that. They can't have a Queen James Bible. We know that the word of God does not change. Because it says in Psalm 119, forever, O Lord, your word is firmly fixed in the heavens. We know that the word of God doesn't change. Isaiah 48 says, the grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand for how long? We know 2 Timothy 3 says, all scripture is God, is breathed out by God. We can't change the word of God. It's not right. They've changed through the Queen James and you can't do that. But if that's wrong for them to change it, why have you changed it? What do you mean, Pastor? Well, you know, I can have sex before marriage. It's not a big deal. I can look at porn. It's not a big deal. I can be young and, you know, be experimenting. That's not a big deal. You know, I've been divorced. I know what sex is. And, and, and I can't go without it. God wouldn't but That's not a big deal. How is it that we say they're wrong for changing the word of God, but then we claim to have the Holy Spirit of God and live just like they live, just with a different sin? The church is confusing the world because we say your sin is wrong, but ours is perfectly fine. Come on, church. I know it hurts, but it helps. Take your Bibles. 
Go to 1 Corinthians 6. And with a broken heart, I read these verses and ask you, what do you want me to do with these? What are we, as people who claim to be men and women of God, do with these verses? 1 Corinthians 6, verse 9. Or do you not know that the unrighteous, again, this is Paul speaking to the people of Corinth who've said, you know, I got saved. I want to live, you know, I, I, I want this Jesus thing, but I'm going to live the way I want. He said, or do you not know that the unrighteous, the lost, the ones who don't have the Holy Spirit, will not inherit the kingdom of God? And do not be deceived. Don't deceive yourselves. Don't lie to yourself. Neither the sexually immoral. Here, sexually immoral is an umbrella term for everything we've been talking about. Teenagers having sex, divorced people having sex, having affairs, men with men, women with women, transgender. It's all sexual immorality. And he's saying they will not inherit the kingdom of God. Why? They don't have the spirit of God. So they're not gonna live by the word of God. They're gonna live by the world standards. He said, don't, be, don't deceive yourselves. Are you kidding me? Neither the sexually immoral nor idolaters. You never look at the word of God, but you stare at the phone. Idolatry, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor greedy. 97% of the American church does not tithe. I wonder if that's stealing from God and because of your greed. Well, that's not talking about me. Then who's it talking about? You know, that sin's okay. But, you know, their sin, church, I'm asking you, what do I do with this? Adulterers, nor men who practice homosexually, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers, <laughs> they will not inherit the kingdom of God. No. According to the word of God, you cannot be a transgender, a homosexual, a lesbian, live a sexually immoral life and be a child of God. It's No. What are we supposed to do with this? You see, but for... Those that have said, well, pastor, listen, listen, that's what I used to be. Now we're talking. I don't care what you were before. God doesn't see us for what we are. God sees us for what we can be. And he says, it is very clear in verse 11. Look at what Paul continues with. And such were some of you. Yeah, you used to be this, but you ain't like that no more. You've turned your back on it because the blood justified you and you're not gonna live that way anymore. And such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ by the spirit of our God. It ain't about what you were, it's about what you have, can become. You see, 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 but here's the problem. We say, can I be a Christian while living as and then we continue to live that way, but say but the way they live is unacceptable. It's all unacceptable unless the Holy Spirit has come and changed you. And that's what you used to be because you repented. What does repent mean? It means the changing of one's mind resulting in the changing of your actions. That's what repentance means. Not, oh, I did that and I get to go to heaven. It got nothing to do with heaven. This is about heaven coming and filling you and you doing what you're supposed to do to get heaven back here on earth. Because that's what you used to be, not what you still are. Let's finish. Go to 1 Corinthians 6 again. Let's just skip down a few more verses to verse 18. Flee, run, get away from sexual immorality everything we're talking about. Why? Because every other sin a person commits is outside the body. Sin, sexual immorality, sin, and sexual content has more consequences and connotations than any other sin. Why? Because you're using the holy temple of God, what the Holy Spirit dwells in for that sin. Don't take my word. Flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body. But sexually immoral person sins against his own body, against the temple, 
Or do you not know that your body, it is not your body, it is his body. Your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God. You are not your own. You are his. For you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. That's what am I supposed to do with that? Tell everybody you're good? Don't be deceived. It's sin. You can't live that way. And if you still desire to live that way, could it be because the Holy Spirit's never got a hold of you and changed you so that you no longer desire that way? Pastor, I'm good. I'm a man. I'm a woman of God. But I don't know what to do with people who live that way. How do I handle people far from God? And not just sexual sin, but how do I handle people who are far from God? I, I, I don't know what to do when people think the way they do, like the world, live the way they do, and then want to call themselves Christians. What do I do? How do I handle them? Glad you asked. Let's finish here. Number one, understand they're lost. They don't know Jesus. They don't have the Holy Spirit inside of them. 1 Corinthians 2.14 was very clear. The natural person cannot think like we do. So why does the church continue to get angry at the world for living like the world? What we should be angry about are people who claim to be full of the Spirit, living like the world, confusing the world, because they're not living like the Word. Someone say amen one time. Number one, you got to understand they're lost. Don't get mad at a dog for barking. This is what they do. Keep going. Number two, you got to love the sinner, not the sin. You got to love the sinner, but not their sin. And you holding a sign, these people go to hell. It's doing no good. Well, pastor, I'm just telling the truth. Wow. Good for you. You're running people away from Jesus. Look what John 1 says. For from his fullness we have, who, who's received? We've all received, listen, listen. Grace, say it with me, grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses and grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Did you notice we got grace and grace and then grace and then the truth? So how can you walk around going, well, I'm just telling the truth the way it is without grace. Grace was meant for people who don't know Jesus. See, what we want to say as a Christian, well, I'm living under God's grace. That is so unbiblical. Because once you've given your life to Christ, it's now about his mercy and not his grace. Second John 1, 3 says this. Oh, you can't have truth without grace. You can't have grace without truth. Second John says this, grace, mercy, and peace will be with us from the God, Father, and from Jesus Christ, the Father's Son. Say it with me. In truth and in love. Wear your t-shirt, turn or burn. All you're doing is people, pushing people away from grace. I don't care how loud you scream, I'm just sharing truth. I want to talk, just in kind of finishing up. Parents. Pastor, I don't know what to do. I got a child, 13, 14, I don't know. I got a boy that wants to be a girl or a girl that wants to be a boy. Pastor, I I don't know what to do with them. Let me just talk to you for a moment, please, from the bottom of my heart. Let's say that this teenager, this child, who's 13, 14, 15, 15, says, hey, mom, dad, hey, I want to bring all my buddies over to the house, and we're going to have a big orgy this weekend. Are you going to say, oh, man, that's a good idea. <laughs> Give me some. Are you going to look at him and say, have you lost your everlasting mind? No. Or what if they come to you and say tomorrow, you know, 
I've decided as a 14-year-old, I'm going to quit school. And I'm just going to live in the basement. And you're going to support me the rest of your life. No, you're not going to tell them it's perfectly fine. Or, or, or what if they come to you and say, hey, buy, I want you to go buy me five cases of beer, a couple bottles of Jack Daniels for this weekend so I can party it up. No, no, I know this is going to be shocking for a lot of you, but you look at your children in all three of those instances and you say, no, you're not going to do that in this house. So what do you do if a child is thinking this way? I got a great idea. Tell them no. And then love them to the cross. And the greatest way to love them to the cross is by you showing them what Jesus looks like and not what the world looks like and then tell them that your sin's okay, but their sin is wrong. Be a parent and not a friend. They need parents, not friends. And here's the truth, here's the truth. As you move forward, you gotta love the sinner not the sin. Number one, understand they don't know Jesus. Number two, love the sinner, not the sin. Number three, your walk with Christ is the greatest thing people are ever going to see when it comes to Christ. The church is killing us in that you want to live like the world and say, my sin's okay, but their sin is wrong. Why don't you let them see Jesus in you because you are the closest thing to Jesus they're ever going to see. And here's the truth. What you think about Jesus will dictate how you live your life. If you think he's a heaven ticket, then you're going to go live as you desire. But if you understand who he is and what he did for us, you can't help but want to go out and try to save the world for him. Number four, your intimacy determines your intensity. Here's what I mean by that. I have people who are in my life that they could come to me and say, what do you think you're doing? You're living this way. Have you lost your mind? There's pastors that I, I pastor people that I have a great relationship, I can go to them and say, what, what are you thinking? This is so unchristlike." But here's the truth. If you have no relationship with somebody, you can't do that because your intimacy determines your intensity. You can't hold a sign and say, you're gonna go to hell and expect that to work because your relationship with them. Because here's the truth. People don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Number five, and this is gonna mess with some of you. Be their friend. Be their friend. Wait, wait, so you, you, you think I should be friends with sinners? Matthew 11 says this. The son of man came eating and drinking, and they say, look at him, a glutton, a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors, scum of the earth, and sinners. If the Holy Spirit dwells inside of you, you can't help but have a burden people who are so far from God because they're not going to live by the word of God because they don't have the Holy Spirit dwelling inside of them. King Jesus, I'm glad this day's over. It's such a tough topic. God, if we don't share it from here, who's going to? So with a broken heart, I come to you asking for you to speak to hearts and lives right now change the way we think from the world to what the Word says because of the Spirit that dwells in us. God, I'm just asking that you be glorified through this message because it is the Word of God. Look at me, church. I'm not going to do some type of invitation. I'm going to come forward because it would be so embarrassing for so many people. This is what I'm going to ask you. If you're one of those that says, I need Jesus, just make your way to the back. Pastor Mark, some other people will be back there and they'll be glad to just show you what a radical love relationship with Jesus truly is. But if you're one of those that's living this lifestyle, you need to repent, which means to change your mind, changes your actions. I'm not gonna ask you to come forward. I don't wanna embarrass you. But right where you are, you better ask God to forgive you, repent, changes the way you think about it. And we'll begin to change the way you live. Everybody stand up with me. King Jesus, just move in heart, change lives. Do something here in this place this afternoon.
King Jesus, my prayer is that you just move your hearts and lives. Help us understand with the Holy Spirit, we live by the word, not by the world. Those who don't have the Holy Spirit are gonna live by the world and not the word. God, may we be a church that is based on the word of God, living for God, change lives for God. And everybody said, I am so glad today is a one of the toughest questions I've had to tackle as a pastor of this church. I hope that it gives you a better understanding of what the Word says on a very difficult topic. Can I have an amen just one time, please? Because I will start off. No, I won't either. No, I won't. You know, before you start grabbing the buckets, let me ask you something real quick, real quick. We'll say people don't have the right to say, this is my body. Because once you give your life to Christ, it's His. But then why do we say it's my time? Well, that's my money. And then steal from God, you know, because that's okay because, you know, that's my sin. So if you're in that aisle, that aisle, that aisle, or that aisle, I just want you to give to God because you're so in love with him, you can't help but say thank you for who he is, what he is, and what he's done in your life. But now if you're not a child of God, why would you want to give to God? Because the Spirit of God doesn't dwell inside of you. If you're a first-time guest, I'm going to walk off the stage and make my way to the VIP room, and I'd love to shake your hand and say thank you so much for coming today and give you a gift. Every year we do what we call baby dedication, but we've changed the name. We're calling it family dedication because your child being dedicated doesn't get your child to heaven ticket. It's more of the mom and dad saying, we're going to raise this child to have the best chance of becoming a man or woman of God. That'll be November 10th, and if you'd like to be a part of that, please get signed up and do so. Last year at our marriage conference, we, I, I asked people, look, why don't we just do it in easily where more people come? And it was unanimous. They said, look, we like getting out of town. We like getting away from family. We like getting away from kids. We just want to leave town. Good enough. So if you're interested in being a part of our marriage retreat this year, please go ahead and start getting signed up. I added this kind of on a personal level. I, I have begun doing a podcast. It comes out every Wednesday. And this week I'm doing what is this series I'm in now is called Struggles. And it's where we as men and women of God struggle. And, and the first one was on forgiveness. I know none of you ever struggled with forgiveness. And the second one was with the mouth. I know none of you ever say something you shouldn't. I know that. But for those who might, it's not this is the sin. We know that. It's how to become better at not being a part of that sin. So if you would, man, just go check that out if you really have a desire. Last thing, I'm going home, taking a shower, and sitting down. How many of you have heard this conversation? Well, about the end of time, the Bible says it. How many of you have heard that conversation going on? Is it the end of time? Let's talk about that next week. Bring a friend. See you then.